welcome to the Fretboard Journal podcast. I'm your host, Jason Verlindy. As always, we have John Rauhouse playing in the background. This week on the podcast, we're sharing another great session from our 2023 Fretboard Summit, and it's an interesting one. When I saw that luthier Jason Costell, who is one of the top tier acoustic guitar makers around, was attending the Fretboard Summit, I reached out to him to see if he'd be game for doing a talk. We bounced a whole bunch of ideas around. Ultimately, Jason asked if he could do a session with fellow builder and friend Mike Bernick on technology and what it means for high end and even quote unquote handmade guitar making. I have known both of these builders for a long, long time. I have to say I had no idea how connected they were or that Mike, who might be best known today for his wild electric guitar builds, had such a profound impact and influence on Jason and his builds. I love it when this happens. I love it when two musicians or two guitar makers come together and share ideas. It's one of my favorite things to do in the magazine. It's one of my favorite things to do at the summit. And I am so glad that this session happened. Though there is some talk about the life of a luthier and what it takes to pay the bills, you definitely don't need to be a guitar maker to appreciate this one. I think anyone who's ordered a custom guitar at some point in your life or thought about it is going to appreciate this chat. I should add our 2024 summit is already scheduled August 23rd to 25th, 2024. If you would like to attend and maybe meet the likes of a Jason Costell or a Mike Bernick or just hang out with us and some of our favorite musicians, now is the time to register fretboardsummit.org. This is going to sell out. 2023 did. It's a great time. It is really this podcast and the pages of our magazine coming to life for three days. It's a really special event, unlike anything you've ever attended. And one late breaking announcement, speaking of events, uh, we appear to be having a meetup at the Phoenix Musical Instrument Museum in February. I think it's going to be February 18th. Jason Costell told me he will try to be there as well. Rich Walter, who was just on this podcast, is going to give us a tour of the exciting new exhibit, Acoustic America at the MIM Museum. It's going to be pretty cool. Our podcast today is brought to you by our friends at Mike and Mike's Guitar Bar, one of my favorite stores in the whole wide world. It happens to be in my backyard here in Seattle. A great selection of vintage electrics, acoustics, pedals, and synths at all price points. And they have a full, and I mean really full, repair shop. If anyone out there is in the area and needs their guitars worked on, hit up Mike and Mike. Stringjoy is offering you all 10% off of your first orders with the discount code FRETBOARD when you check out uh, a super cool string company based in Nashville doing something interesting. Acoustic guitar strings, electric guitar strings. Check these things out. You will love them. Pighead Nation, my favorite music instruction portal around, is offering you your first month free or $20 off of any annual subscription with the promo code fretboard when you check out a great gift i might add if anybody wants to give the gift of better playing to their friends and last but not least you can still get a discount on isotope by using the discount code fret 10 again this conversation took place at the fretboard summit 2023 now like a lot of fretboard summit talks this one uh, had some audience questions at the very end You may not be able to hear those. I tried to crank up the volume. Regardless, you'll hear the responses and get a sense of what the question was. And uh, I hope you enjoy it. This was a great chat, one of many from the 2023 Fretboard Summit. Okay. First off, the name of this uh, lecture seminar thing, it's not handcrafted versus technology. Correct. Because there's no weapons, right? There's no weapons in the room. Yeah, we're not going to fight to the death. Yeah. Jason's more of a hands-on lit chisel guy, and I'm more of the, the tech guy. But um, we're going to introduce each other, and then uh, we're going to talk a little bit about what we do with CNC, and then we're going to take uh, questions and, and answers. Yeah, does that work for you guys? Hopefully, uh, we'll be able to answer some questions. So like Mike said, um, this was a talk, uh, you know, it was kind of funny. Jason reached out to me not too long ago and said, will you give a talk? And what we're talking about today is something I'm passionate about. I'm a handcrafted builder. I do everything by hand right now. Um, But as I've gone through my my life and my career, I've gotten injured a couple times. And as I get older, 
uh, things that were really easy for me to do are starting to become more difficult. I'm sure some of you in the audience can relate to that. And so I have started on this journey of looking into technology and what's available. And Mike has been my friend and also my mentor. And, and I don't tell a lot of people this, but he's actually the reason I got into guitar building. Way back when, when I was a, a guitar player, I owned one of his guitars. And as I started on this journey, um, I went to Roberto Venn in Arizona and Mike had a shop in Tempe at the time. And my, my goal was to finish the guitar building school and come work for Mike. And around halfway through the course, Mike came in and said, all right, you know, my name is Mike Baranek and I'm moving to San Luis Obispo. So that plan kind of fell apart for me. But the point of all that is throughout my entire journey, Mike and I have been friends, um, but he's also been kind of a sounding board for me as I try new ideas or try to kind of navigate that stuff. So I wanted to talk about this correlation between the handcrafted side and the technological side. And I was going to do it all by myself and realized I'm kind of an imposter on the technological side because I haven't really gotten into it. I'm trying to get into it. So I asked Mike to come join me because he's been doing this for about a decade and a half. If you haven't seen his work, definitely, you know, go check it out. Um, so what we're going to do is just like Mike said, I'm going to, I'll talk a little bit about my journey. Mike's going to talk about his and, and then Based on that, we'll kind of open it up to questions, but I hope what you get out of it is what Michael alluded to, which is this is not a me versus him. Um, there's, there's pros and cons to both styles of building. And in the beginning for me, uh, I was very strongly in the handcrafted side. I would fight you over that. Um, and now uh, for different reasons, I'm kind of falling into the category of there's this symbiotic relationship between both of them, and I think they have a huge place in our life. Um, my background, uh, just prior to guitar building, I, I served in the military for about a decade and a half, went into the corporate world after that, didn't like it, decided to become a guitar builder. Um, I've been doing this for, I guess, about 16, 17 years now, and um, I started out learning from Kent Everett in Atlanta, Georgia. I then went to Roberto Venn, uh, which is a guitar building school in Phoenix. I stayed on as an instructor. And then I went to Irvin Samaji's for three years as an apprentice. And I ended up back in Phoenix back in 2011, where I've been building full time since then. I build about 15 to 20 guitars a year. I do them as a one person shop. And uh, I, like I said, I'm, I'm kind of very heavily rooted in the handcrafted side. I love using chisels. I love using planes. I am kind of this nerd when it comes to a new tool and I love to learn how to use it. Um, and over the years, uh, I've found that when you're trying to maintain the efficiency that Richard talked about in the last talk, um, it gets very difficult. And my typical work week for me is seven days a week and I work 18 to 20 hour days. So when you are thinking of a handmade builder like myself, not everybody does that, um, but it's difficult to do 20 guitars a year as a one person shop to the level that I want to do it at and not spend all your time essentially in the shop. So work life balance is kind of non-existent for me. Uh, it's caused issues with relationships. It's caused issues with just my own personal enjoyment and love of the craft. And so as I've kind of moved through that journey, I've been constantly trying to figure out how do I increase efficiency while maintaining quality. And what I found is that this kind of the evil empire of the technology side, the CNC side that I was against for so long, um, suddenly felt like it maybe was offering some opportunities and some answers in the sense that not every part of the guitar needs an artisan to do it to a certain degree. There are certain things that are just a process. And just like I would use a router or I would use a drill press, a CNC is a tool. And I started to realize that if I could learn how to do that, there are opportunities within the, the construct of building a guitar where, uh, for instance, a fingerboard. I don't know that any player out there really derives intense pleasure from knowing that I make my fingerboards by hand, 
I think they all care that my fret slots are in the right place. So there's certain things where you can have this argument of like, oh, you're no longer an artist, you're no longer a craftsman. And yet at the end of the day, the precision to which we want the fret slots to be in the right place determines whether or not the guitar plays in tune. And I think that's far more important than whether or not I sit there with a handsaw and you get to look at me in candlelight in my old world shop, you know, constructing this guitar. Um, <clears throat> as I said, injuries, um, I am renowned within our guitar community as being the guy that just gets hurt. Um, it's because I love to live my life, but that means I fall off mountains and all kinds of stuff. And so things that were very comfortable and easy for me early on, um, I, I severed some tendons in my hand a couple years ago. And so holding a chisel, if I hold it for 15 hours a day, you know, that repetitive use injury starts to kick in. And so I had to make a decision for myself, do I want to keep doing this? And, and I could either walk away and say, hey, you know, my body is not really working well as I get older, um, so do I move on or do I continue to do this, but I find ways to maybe alleviate some of the stress on my body and open up opportunities to do the hand skill stuff where it matters, but then use the machine um, where it doesn't matter. And when I started thinking it in terms of that, I realized I'm already doing that. I'm, I'm already using routers for things that can be done very quickly. I'm already using the bandsaw. So like when we talk about handcrafted, I'm not sitting there with a handsaw and I'm not sitting there with a, a crank drill press. Like I'm already using technology and I'm already using tools that are modern tools. Uh, so the CNC to me is just kind of a new avenue of approach to that but it frees up a lot of time, takes me about a day and a half to carve a neck. And I, I think, Mike, you said you carve a neck in like 17 minutes. 17 minutes. So if I build 20 guitars a year at a day and a half per neck carving, that's 30 days that I'm doing one task on a process that has maybe 300 to 400 tasks. So again, all of you in whatever walk of life you're on, you can imagine if all of a sudden somebody said, hey, do you want to free up 30 days you're still going to, you're actually going to probably get better quality and you're going to get it done. The repeatability is there. Um, it's the moron in me from a couple years ago that would have been like, nope, must do it by hand, must waste as much time as possible. And now I'm realizing all of you as builders or players or consumers, we want a really nice feeling neck, right? We want it to be consistent. I want to know that if I play one of my guitars at this store and I commission one that the guitar that I receive is going to feel similar. So all these things that I was fighting just suddenly the switch went off and it made sense. And um, so where I am in my journey is I, I'm still doing everything by hand and I'm in the process of learning to understand the CAD design start side of it. Um, and I'm trying to figure out how to integrate that into the, the, the creation side, the execution side. Um, for those of you that are builders that are interested in learning this, I recently took a class by a, a gentleman named Tom Dahlia. And Tom does an online CAD program for guitars. Uh, he taught uh, CNC and did CNC at the Brian Gallup School for years. He's now off on his own. And because it's tailored to guitar making, I learned more in that couple day course than anything else that I've done. Um, so I'm at the beginning of my journey. I don't know what it's gonna look like moving forward. I just know that for me to continue to build guitars and enjoy it and love it for years to come, I need to make some changes both in my efficiency so I can add time and actually enjoy my life a little bit and also mitigate the repetition and repetitive use injuries that happen from doing the same thing over and over again. And so with that, I'm gonna kind of turn the, the mic over to Mike who has been doing this for, for a decade and a half or so, and he'll talk to you about his journey. Uh, my, my name is Mike Baranek. Uh I went to Roberto Van. I looked at, I was thinking about this last night. Uh, it's 30, 30 years ago this week. So it's, it's pretty crazy. Uh, started when I was 22, 52. Um, 
Roberto Venn, there was, you know, at the time there was no talk about CNCs in 93, 94. Um, so you learn how to do everything with templates and um, jigs and stuff like that. And uh, I started my business in 1998 um, after working at the school. I worked at the Roberto Venn School as an um, assistant instructor and then worked for a, another, like, small custom shop for about, I think, about a year. And there, you know, there was no CNC involved in that place. Um, started my business, and in the beginning, I was really into electric guitars. Like that was my thing. Like I was into Strat, you know, custom Strats and Tellys and things like that. So I wasn't even really thinking about acoustic guitars. Um, but was really lucky to start building acoustic guitars, like at the golden age of the handmade acoustic guitar. You know, like '96, '97 was like the kind of the year that the Hillsburg uh, Guitar Show started. Um, and I built, let's see, I started, I got my first CNC in uh, 2004, and I built like 90, probably about 95 acoustic guitars without the aid of CNC. Um, the whole reason I got into the CNC stuff wasn't to uh, so much be more productive. It was something that interested me, like just learning, you know. And at the time, there was no YouTube. There was no, there wasn't a lot of machines to uh, you could afford. You know, like the um, Fidels and stuff were all like about a hundred grand. Uh, but there was a small company in Phoenix, and they were making some small mills, and they were like in the three to five thousand dollar range. <clears throat> and I bought one of those used, and I had a, a friend uh, in Phoenix that was doing using the same machine, and so I would just kind of pick his brain, and. Uh, so it was like old school, right? Like using like really old version of AutoCAD to draw out your 2D parts uh, and then using actually DOS programs to run the machine. And I think the most important part of uh, introducing CNC into your, your, your career, your luthery career, is to actually build a lot of stuff and get your craft down before you introduce it. So I feel like carving 90 necks by hand and knowing how to carve that neck by, you know, using other methods uh, was really important. Um, and when I first started using the CNC, um, I was, you know, doing basic things like I was cutting out bridge plates that would fit perfectly in the X, uh, uh, the X brace. And you know, doing uh, purflings on headstocks and stuff like that, just to help speed up uh, uh, the time of, uh, you know, routing something on. A, I would normally do it with like a jig. So the CNC just kind of helped free up and make sure that I didn't make a mistake uh, making those parts. Um, and then I got a router, like a, a, a tabletop router, two, two, two foot by four foot router. And I kind of went real crazy with it when I first got it. Cause I had had the other machine for about a year and I kind of decided I was like, Oh man, I'm going to like try to do everything on this thing. So I was writing, you know, programs to like actually uh, machine the, uh, the glue joint for the backs and tops and stuff like that. And I realized after a while, it's like there's a certain place for the machine and there's a certain place to do, to do it the other way or, you know, the traditional way with uh, other machines. And um, let me think. Uh, when I started doing the acoustics with the CNC, the first when I would tell you know when people would ask me about oh how do you how do you do your your, your process and I would tell them oh I'm using a CNC for this everyone that told me was like man your guitars don't look like they're they're like made by a CNC and that's because the CNC is not really a push and play thing where you're, you're pressing a button and you're getting the part out. I, I can carve a neck in 17 minutes, but I still have to sand that neck. I still have to finish, you know, finish the carve to make it feel right. And I think that's my, my point is like, if you don't know how a neck should feel or how your neck should feel, um, then yeah, it, it kind of defeats the purpose of using it. So. Yeah, there's, I've seen quite a few people that go through, they, they decide they're going to become luthiers, and so they buy a CNC and start making parts. 
And at the end of the day, it just doesn't feel like a comfortable guitar because they don't know what they're doing per se. Right. They're, it's like a luthier that becomes a CNC operator versus an op a CNC operator <clears throat> becomes a luthier are two different, completely mm -hmm. two different things, you know? Yeah. I always think of it, most of us, I think, grew up reading like a map going on a road trip. And, and that was how you got from point A to point B. And then this magical thing, the GPS was developed and it made life easier. But if the batteries go dead or the GPS fails, most of us can still pull out a map and figure out how to get to where we're going. Uh, the newer generation, not so much. But um, So I think that's, that's kind of the analogy that I use. As somebody was, We were talking the other day and somebody said, you know, you don't use a CNC for every task. It's not running 24-7. I mean, it is in, in major production shops. But in a shop like Mike's or what I intend to use it for, uh, I mean, it's just like every other tool. You know, there's an hour of use you know, during every three day period or something like that. But what the CNC does, in my opinion, again, going back to my 20 hour workday, um, and that's not an exaggeration. It's, it's, uh, my day kind of starts at seven and ends anywhere between one and three thirty in the morning, because that's just kind of who I am. And, uh, there's nothing right about that. It's, it's wrong, but it means I spend a lot of time working in the middle of the night and that means I spend a lot of time working when I'm tired. And one of the benefits to the CNC is the the machine doesn't get tired. The machine doesn't start to think, oh, I haven't slept in two days, so I you know, could make a mistake. So there's some really incredible consistency in the in the product that comes out and your ability to fit it and use it uh, almost immediately. I think there's a lot of adaptability too if if you are consumers and you're ordering a guitar, if you come to me and you say, I want this one part or one aspect of the guitar to be different, I may have to redesign my molds. I may have to redesign my build process in order to work around that. And a lot of times that means I have to charge for the time. If, if there's 50 hours put into redesigning something for your one little request, um, that can be expensive, it can be timely. Uh, a lot of times with CAD, you can go into the system and you adjust parameters and now you have a new part that's created, you know, almost instantly and didn't require a whole lot of time and energy. So there's a lot of flexibility in that. Um, yeah, I think the, the, the biggest hurdle to getting in, involved with CNC stuff is like learning the software, learning how to uh, do the CAD. Um, and I, I think the best thing to do is like, if you're, if you're, uh, you know, a professional luthier and you're, you're working on guitars already is to like maybe get a 3d printer or something and start, uh, designing something in the CAD that you can actually make. Because I think a lot of people get excited about it and they like get Rhino or, um, one of the other programs like fusion 360 and they, it's, it's, it's kind of over overwhelming on that, on that aspect. And then, uh, they kind of lose interest. I think the other reason too, is like, if you're, if you're just designing something on a computer, you're not really seeing a physical object off of that. And so like a CNC, uh, is a great way to get your, your, your business going where maybe you're more productive, but like Jason says, it's, it's gonna, um, it's gonna free you up, you know, for, for, for fatigue. Um, you know, I'm, I'm 52 now and like, I, I need that machine to, to carve my necks. I don't want to be carving those, those necks all day long. Um, and so I think that one of the things you should do is like, if you're really interested in it is, you know, buy it, buy a $200, uh, 3d printer and download one of those free, you know, fusion 360, uh, programs and just start messing around with it. There's so there's so much like when I started doing it, there there was nothing on YouTube about like how to how to do CAD, and now like there's tutorials on just about every part of making a guitar, um, anything. And if you get stuck, you can just like Google it, you know, and find and find find the information to uh, figure out how where how to fix it. Yeah, you know, one of the uh, things that I found fascinating, especially on the acoustic side, I don't feel like you really see it on the electric side, but there's this really negative connotation 
to the idea of, of utilizing a CNC in the construction of a steel string guitar. And I always think of, you know, how many here have heard of Jim Olson? All right. So Jim's a great friend of mine, uh, again, kind of a mentor. He spends about half his year in Arizona, so we spend a lot of time together. And, um, you know, Jim, Jim got into his style of building, which started out using about 100 different routers, and every router was set up with one task in mind. So he would pull a router off, use it for 20 seconds, put it back, grab the next router. And he did that because when he was a child, he had polio and lost the use of a good percentage of the left side of his body and wasn't able to raise his arm. And so using tools over and over and over again were very difficult for him. So the router method was a way of increasing his efficiency, but also working around some of the issues he was dealing with. And then he got into CNCs. And, you know, at this point, the vast majority of his parts of, of the guitar are all made on the CNC, but he still puts them together, hand fits them and everything else. And to this day, we consider Jim to be one of the finest handcrafted builders of our current generation, you know, the, the modern community. And I think that says a lot because, you know, here's somebody that is using technology and for him in particular, we've never really looked down upon it. It's always been this positive thing. And Jim's able to knock out anywhere from 40 to 50 guitars a year <clears throat> as a one person shop in six months. And then he comes to Phoenix and he plays golf for six months. Like that's the life that he lives. And, and I think that's very indicative because when I first started going down this route, one of the big barriers for me was my belief that all of my peers were also doing everything by hand. And so I felt like, well, I don't want to be the only guy that goes down this route. And then I started talking to some of them and they'd say, oh, no, I've been using CNC for six years. I just keep it hidden in the closet and nobody sees it when they come to the shop. And that made me realize not only am I the idiot because I'm not pursuing this, but there is this connotation that like we have to protect our reputation. We can't let people know that we're using CNC. Meanwhile, on the electric side, people are like, Bam! you know, CNC for the win. So part of the reason I wanted to do this, um, you know, when Jason reached out to me, there are a lot of different topics I could have picked, but this is new in my journey and I've never been somebody to hide behind what I what I want to do or the path that I want to take. I, I'm kind of a big believer in you own it and and embrace it deeply and people are either going to follow you on that journey or they'll fall by the wayside and I'm okay with either answer. But this to me is is kind of my way of saying like this is the new path for me and I'm excited about it and I'm excited about it because it's going to allow me to build better guitars or maybe different guitars and, and more innovative guitars than what I'm building right now because I have limitations that I that I need to work around. And it's exciting for me to think that the guitar that I'm making 10 years from now will be completely different than what I'm making now because I have new opportunities and maybe a new mindset in how I approach it. And so, um, you know, I, I, I just don't think there's a negative downside to it. And I'm starting to see more of the acoustic builders be open about the fact that they're using it. And I'm starting to see more of the consumers, the clients that we have being okay with that, uh, especially when they see the quality of the instrument that it makes. Um, inlay is a great example too. I mean, I, you know, I, I revere the inlay artists out there. I am not one of them. So if somebody comes to me and says, my dream is to have this beautiful tree of life inlay on my fingerboard, if I draw it, it's going to be a bunch of stick figures and, and things like that. And, and if that's what you want, I'm happy to execute. But the idea that now with a CNC and CAD, I could draw that out in a way that it looks good, I could execute it. And at the end of the day, whether it was inlaid by hand or inlaid by a tool, I don't think detracts from the beauty of the overall design. And as Mike alluded to, you know, to, to design in CAD is a whole skill set in itself. There are people that spend their entire life studying them. I say life, uh, we've only had it for a couple decades, but the point is, is you can, you can take an entire long period of time to learn that skill in the same way that Mike and I have spent our entire, you know, adult careers learning to build guitars. So, um, 
So my hope in having this talk was was kind of that the idea of like Mike said in the beginning, it, for some reason it was phrased as like handcrafted versus technology, and and we didn't mean to imply that. This is much more of an embracing of it. And if you go look at at Mike's guitars, um, they're incredible. Uh, you know, it's um, and I, I say that I, I tell this to him all the time, but I've watched his journey. And I revered him as an acoustic guitar builder. And I remember around the time where the light switch kind of clicked in his acoustic guitar journey and using CNC because all of a sudden there were decorative appointments that were just incredible. He came up with a new neck joint that wouldn't have been able to really be done by hand in, a, in an efficient method. And so all of a sudden it kept elevating his guitar building. And then he decided to go this electric route. And at the time, I just remember thinking like, well, this will be interesting. We'll see where it goes. And I, I mean, I tell him all the time, but every single electric guitar that he has put out is, is to me just one of the most beautiful things in the world. And so part of that is who Mike is as a builder and the ability to, to tap into that design element and everything else. But part of that is, you know, if, if I was Mike and we approach it from the handcrafted side and I think, oh, I just came up with this amazing new electric guitar bridge. I don't know how to do the metallurgy to, to either cast the bridge or hand file it and then, you know, code it and all this stuff. And there are people that do that, but I wouldn't know how to do that. And I don't think Mike would either. So the fact that he can write a program and then literally route out the most beautiful bridge, played it, and now he has this unique guitar. So I, I feel like it's created new opportunities in his instruments, and it's that same innovation that I've watched him go through that I am feeling in my own build. I feel stagnant, and I, I kind of do the same thing because I'm not a creative person in my opinion. And so I build the same guitar. I focus heavily on tone, and it's time for me to start throwing some some things out there and see what what come back you know what come back uh, from that so I'm always going to voice my tops I'm always going to make it sound good because at the end of the day a guitar is functional art if I make it beautiful but it doesn't play then I've failed so I'm always going to care about the end result and the quality of the guitar but I'm excited because I feel like I now have some new opportunities to grow as an individual and grow in my creative journey that it, if I'm completely honest, I just don't have the capability to do right now. Um, so that's, uh, I think that's about it. Do you want to open it up to questions and see, or do you have anything else? Yeah, I mean, say? I think the, the the main thing with the CNC for me was like, it really did open opportunities to like go places that I couldn't go if I didn't have it, you know, um, uh, just design wise and uh, tr trying to create something that, wouldn't be possible uh, with just using jigs. Um, and it also just allows me to like try something. If it doesn't work, you know, it's not that big of a loss. You know, I don't have a, a whole heck of a lot of time in carving something or tr doing a rosette hours and hours and then finding out it's not something I want, that, a path I want to go to where I can tweak it. So is anybody in here doing CNC right now? What? Uh, <laughs> and our whole shop is, is a blend. Uh huh. Right. So you have like a small tabletop thing or yeah, CNC? Small table. Yeah. Hand yeah. I mean, what I did with when I first started doing CNC, like I used a pro, I, I, car, I had a duplicarver first and I, I like carved the neck like I normally would carve, but I didn't glue the fretboard on. And then I used that um, neck I carved by hand as a uh, as a template for my duplicarver. So I was carving two necks at, at one time, which was pretty fast, but there was a little bit of slop in the duplicarver. So it was never like 100%. And then when I switched to CNC, I took that same neck I carved and I, I used a, a probe to, to write the cloud point for the, for the program. So I was basically carving a neck that I, I had carved already by hand. And I actually, I just stopped using that program. Like, so that I did this in 2005. I just stopped using that program. Like last week, I, I, I took that same neck, the same template neck, and I cut it up on, uh, so I can get a cross section and I traced it out and I 
scanned it in the computer and I drew I drew it in you know in the CAD program and had now I have a 3D model of that same neck that I've been using for the Duke Carver probe and now I have a, a digital file off that neck and it's the same neck that I've been using and everyone loves that neck so it's like yeah. I have that that always to go back to now. Um, did you suggest a uh, 3D print? Yeah. To get a handle on a pad? Yeah, just to kind of, I, I mean, the, the, the two things is, I mean, you could get yourself like one of those little CNC, Amazon CNCs too. You know, they have like those little $300 CNCs and just start learning on that and yeah. scale it up. I think the, the, a lot of people think, oh God, I got to buy, you know, a thousand dollars worth of software and I got to buy a $10,000 machine. I got to buy all the tooling and all this stuff where if you just kind of got some, some basic student software and started drawing in it and you could print something. So you actually have some kind of a, you know, uh, 3d object that you can say, oh, this really is working or not working. So. What, does anybody have any questions that they would like answered? Deep burning questions. Now's your chance. Yeah, I mean, I feel like this talk is really giving a shining example of how technology was kind of promised to us is making us able to do things that we want to otherwise, making a more equitable society for us all. Um, do you feel like that this embracing of technology is? not only allowing people who are already in the space to continue doing it and to be able to expand themselves further, but do you think it's also allowing other people who wouldn't otherwise be able to be in the space to be more involved in all of this? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, right now, tech, there's technology everywhere. It's getting shoved down our throat, right? Mm -hmm. But it's all being used, like, for advertising or getting our data, this is a way for us to use technology for us to, to, you know, propel ourselves forward. So I feel like, um, uh, it's, it's, it's a great way to take control and, and, and continue to make yourself better and then have something that, you know, like you said, um, keeps you from getting fatigued or, you know, as you get older, it gets harder. Your eyes get, you know, your eyesight goes and, arm hurts you know I, i've got this kink in my arm right now and like it, it's been there for about a week and if i had to carve a neck last week you know it would be really hard to do i think one of the <clears throat> constraints or, or limitations for most people getting into the industry is the financial side of it um we romanticize building guitars and i we used to do this when i was at roberto venn where you would sit down and you would say, okay, uh, let's start with what do you need to live each month in your current city, your current lifestyle, whatever. And it didn't really matter what, what number somebody came up with. It could be a thousand dollars a month. It could be $6,000 a month. Um, and you say, okay, so as a luthier, um, for one guitar, what's the cost of materials? And you come up with an amount and then you say, how much can you sell the guitar for? Okay, you come up with an amount. And then you say, well, you're probably going to sell it through a dealer. What does the dealer take? And then what's the cost to keep the lights on in your shop and pay the bills and everything else, internet, you know, things like that. So the bottom line is you, as a new builder, um, you know, whether it's an acoustic guitar or an electric guitar, what you find is that in most cases, the percentage of expenses is either almost equal to what you can sell the instrument for, and in some cases it surpasses that. So, you know, you say, oh, I, I can build a $4,000 guitar, and, and people, consumers do what I call the dumb math, right? You know, you can say, well, X number of guitars a year at this much, this is what this person makes. But most people work traditional jobs, so they're not keeping the business open. They're not covering the insurance. They're not paying the legal fees and everything else. So what you find is that that a $4,000 guitar for a new builder may end up costing them $3,400 or $3,500. So the profit margin is $500 per guitar. So now you have to say, how many do you have to make and more importantly, how many do you have to sell every single month just to cover your living expense? 
So the running joke is, you know, like every successful luthier has a, a wife that has a good job, you know, or a partner that has a good job. I don't have that. And so when I was getting started, I had to figure out like, how do you make this work? And if you're a new luthier and you're trying out to figure out how to make and sell eight guitars a month in order to just pay your current living expenses, you're going to fail in most cases. And so what the technology allows people to do is to come into the career field and cut down on the time because you're not necessarily going to be able to charge more in the beginning, but you can make it faster and you can cut down on mistakes and you can eliminate all of the, the downtime that a normal builder has. And so I don't necessarily think it, it makes it easier, but to your point, you might be able to change that profit margin a little bit because now instead of it taking me four weeks to build an instrument, it takes me one week and I can build more. So I, I do think in some ways it makes it more equitable um, in alleviating or reducing some of the hurdles that new people in this industry come in contact with. And while I always revere those that have gone before me and are the trailblazers, and I'm always proud of where we are, we all care about music. We all care about guitar. And at the end of the day, what we want to do is perpetuate the love of music for generation and generation to come. And the only way we do that is by embracing the new luthiers coming up that want to do this and trying to do whatever we can to make it viable for them as a career field. Uh, Mike, yeah. Three top tips for uh, holding the calibration next slide. Uh, I mean, you got to keep your machine lubricated, clean. You got to keep dust. I mean, dust collection is really important. Um, you know, that builds up on the on on everything, and that would you know causes binding and everything else. Sensors, Sensors? like yeah. limit switches. You mean or? I mean, uh, like it's. I think it's important to like you know go, yeah de definitely go into the software and like. Um, calibrate the the axes, you know. Um, I'll do that every once in a while. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I got a newer machine. Uh, I, I the machine I got in two thousand five. I used up till um, about what was it twenty twenty, and then Jason actually had the same machine that he had never used, and the the, the that's yeah, how I roll. <laughs> it, the company went out of business, and so my Z slide was really messed up. So I I got his machine. But it had sat in Phoenix for so long that the wiring was all bad, and I had to re so I had to rewire the whole machine. And my whole idea was like, oh, I'll I'll, uh, I'll fix up his, and I'll have mine as a backup. And I spent so much time working on his, uh, and the the parts weren't compatible. Like the Z slide didn't fit on that because they had made the adaptions. It was like a three three years between the models. So I wound up rebuilding my machine and rebuilding his machine, uh, and it it took so much time that I finally just got a, like a, a, a newer machine. Um, and that machine is like, it's got, you know, the, the advancements in the last 15 years for home machines is incredible. Like the machine I got now is, uh, it's leaps and bounds better. You know, it's got, it's got, uh, covers for the, the slides and everything. So there's not dust getting on it. Uh, dust collection, you know, like a, um, a, bit, a dust boot coming up and down. So, anyone else in the middle? What are the, uh, the operations that are this is the acoustic guitar? What are the operations that are helpful that uh, seem to be most helpful that I hear a lot about next? But are there other things that are helpful in the same condition? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, most of it, I would say, like Mike said, you find out that a lot of the stuff you can do it faster by hand than setting up the machine and things like that. The the areas where I am focusing and trying to, to get to would be fingerboards, I think are really important because again, the placement of the fret slot is imperative to playing intonated. Um, I think the neck, because the contour and feel of the neck is so important and consistency from neck to neck is important. And I think bridges are another one where as we see more and more people get into 
unique and artistic bridge design, they just take an inordinate amount of time. Uh, it takes me uh, a little over half a day, sometimes like, you know, six hours to carve a bridge from start to finish. And when I was talking to Mike about it a couple of years ago, he's, you know, a couple minutes. I mean, it's, it, it happens instantaneously almost. And so I feel like those are kind of the big ones on the acoustic guitar. The other thing is, is that I use a lot of jigs, uh, jigs and fixtures, and you can create the jigs and fixtures on the CNC. So I'm not using the CNC to make the guitar. I'm using it to do a process, to make a tool to do the process. And the benefit to that is if I knock it off my bench and it gets damaged or whatever, I can literally go back to the machine and replicate the same jig or fixture over again. So that's where I see it being kind of imperative to me. Ro rosettes as well. Like um, mm -hmm. not, not only doing like traditional rosettes, like I do like an oval rosette with an extra side port and it's, you know, the lines are very fine. And um, so just being creative with design because you're only limited so much you can do with you know, like a circle, circle router cutting jig, you know, cross grain routing. Um, when you have a laminate trimmer or a router, it's just a set RPM, 16,000, 30,000, whatever. And every time you're kind of going with the grain, it cuts really cleanly. And the minute you cross the grain, you have potential for tear out. And what is amazing to me about a CNC is your ability to determine the feed rate, the spin rate, I'm probably not using the right terms, but um, as it crosses the grain, I can slow the feed rate down, increase the speed, and I can't do that. I mean, I can do it by hand, but I can't do it perfectly and consistently. So I just feel like, like with Mike said with rosettes, that's an incredible one because you don't get the tear out that you get when you're kind of doing it by hand. So... So uh, when I've seen molds cut out on CNC, the, the longest part of that is the glue dry time of joining the different pieces of material. The, it, you can draw a shape, a two-dimensional shape in CAD, and you can literally take the perimeter of that shape and that becomes the, the shape of your mold and you just draw a rectangle around it and you've now created a mold in a program. You extrude it to your depth and now I say I want you to cut three quarter inch MDF and you put a piece of MDF on the machine and I, I would say within five minutes you're cutting your mold out. And, and so you can make adjustments like that very quickly. Um, and like I said, the glue time would be the longest part of that. But it's it's very well suited to that kind of thing. Uh, the other thing that's pretty neat is in CAD, you can model stuff. So you can tell right away if something's not going to work, um, either in the modeling or in the, the CAM portion of it where you see the machining side of it. As a handmaker, I have to go ahead and do it. Um, I was just working on a, a guitar recently where you're about to do a really advanced, difficult task. And I was at a point in the build where if I screwed up, I was starting the entire guitar over again. That's a significant emotional event. When you've invested, you know, two months of building, it's a potentially, uh, you know, tens of thousands of dollars on the line. And I'm, I'm holding a router and I'm like, if anything in this process goes poorly, I begin again. And with a CNC, you, you have ways that that can happen, but they're few and far between. And so I would feel more confident in this machine that's calibrated and everything else to have the perfect feed rate, the perfect, you know, uh, spindle rate. Um, so I just, I think it's much more beneficial. Well, the other thing too is like you can machine a part and if there's a flaw in the wood, you haven't wasted, you know, half a day carving a that's neck. A good point. So, yeah. Um, you know, there's always pin knots or some kind of a, st a streak or something that could show up. And maybe that's going to go on a different guitar. So like I, when I carve my necks, I carve them, you know, the fretboard's not glued on there yet. So I'm basically machining the neck and I can choose, I can see what the grain looks like. 
you know, maybe maybe if there's something in the heel, I, I can put that set set that aside and I can use it like on a sunbursted guitar. Um, but it does, you know, it allows you to not waste time where you're working on a, on a guitar for your customer and you realize, oh, this piece of wood's got a flaw and I got to start all the way from the scratch again. I think we have time for one more question. Up in the back. That's a long discussion. Um, what I will, uh, and, and I'm happy to have the talk with you. I, we can't do it in two minutes, but um, I don't think, I, I don't think in any, yeah, for that. I don't think in any way, shape, well, so the only thing I would say, and again, this is me making this up because I don't do this, but theoretically, do you, do you cut your braces on the CNC? No. No. So theoretically, you could pre-shape your braces and you would glue them down and maybe that would get you 80% of the way there. So it's a time saver because at least for me, what I've found is top after top after top, they everything comes within kind of a 5% margin. So if I wanted to start doing something at that 95% finish point, I might be able to do that. And then I just take it that last 5% of the way there by hand. But voicing to me is the soul of my guitar. I mean, that, that's why it's a Costal versus a Baronek versus a Samaji versus a whatever. And I don't know that I would ever want to give that up to a machine because um, there are scientific ways of figuring out how to voice your guitar. I don't use any of them. I am a tactile feel guy. I flex the wood, I tap it, I hear it. And just like many of you could listen or hum an A, I can hear what I want to hear in a top and I know when it's ready to go. Um, and I, a machine can't do that because it's gonna be different based on the thickness of the top plate, the, the splay of the braces and everything else. So I could see a CNC maybe removing some of that process that is generic but the actual voicing part of the guitar to me is is there's so much that goes into that that I just don't see a machine ever being able to do that. Well, I say that, and then we'll have AI that's making a better sounding guitar than me. But well, thank you. Well, uh, yeah, go ahead. I had one more question. I think yeah. there, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we would come in, I think they have the idea that, like, I'm, I've got to have a 1935 Martin because these guys are blue ears that came over from the old world. Yeah. And they weren't. They were farmers that worked yeah. out of the home and bought the farm and framed barns on the weekend. And the Gibson girls only took jobs at Gibson because the military wasn't paying their husbands enough to feed the kids. So it's a, it's, it's a combination of the science and the art. And yeah. Whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So. Uh, yeah. The term luthier is an interesting term, in my opinion, right? Because we, I, I feel like when we use the term, we we make the assumption that everybody's some kind of master at what they do, and. Uh, for, to give you an example, I've built 216 guitars. That means throughout the course of my time as an instructor, I might have observed maybe another couple hundred built. But using just my guitars as a reference, every task on an instrument I've only done 216 times, plus or minus 5%, 10% for, for mistakes being made. So people will overnight ship a guitar from Europe to me to do a setup on. But the guy at the local music store has done more setups in a month than I'll do maybe in the last 10, 15 years. So this belief that the that the craftsman is always the best person to do it, I don't necessarily subscribe to. I think when you look at Martin as a company, they're a great example because they have employees that have longevity and they stay there forever because it's a family. And they do one task over and over and over again. The, when I go through the Martin factory, I am amazed at how quickly and efficiently somebody can do a task, often without all the measurements and everything else that I have to do. Because when you've done something that many times to a high standard, you get really good at it. We as luthiers may do that same task once, and then we don't do it again for another three months or four months. 
So we pride ourselves on the ability to focus on those things and, and be fixated on them and do them really well. But it doesn't necessarily mean we're the master at it because through the course of our lifetime, some of us will never do that task as much as somebody in a factory does it in a month or three months. Um, so I, I think, you know, that's kind of what we're talking about here is the ability to really take every skill set and we as the luthier can decide where do we need to put our hand skills so that it's a handmade instrument and where do we allow technology to take over because it's a process and we just want to do the process to the best of our ability. So, thank you for sitting and, and hanging out with us for a little bit. Enjoy the rest of the show. I said enjoy the rest of the yeah, show. Yeah, thanks, guys. All right, that was our talk. Mike Bernick and Jason Costel, two of the greatest people around who happen to build some of the finest instruments around. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or share this podcast with your friends on social media. I know the world is falling apart and not many people share things like podcasts anymore on social media. But do it if you want. It will help spread the word. And as always, if you have any feedback or questions or anything, podcast at fripboardjournal.com is the way to get a hold of me. Till next time. <laughs>